Hi, everybody. Welcome to Liquor Store Dreams. We're going to be starting in a few minutes. This event is titled Building Together on Black and Organizing, Asian Organizing in LA. We're going to be screening clips from Liquor Store Dreams with our awesome panelists. We're going to give it a minute or two for people to get in. And we have ASL and captioning available as well. So please make sure you click on captioning if you need that access and let us know if you have any questions. Welcome everybody to Building Together on Black and Asian Organizing in Los Angeles. We're waiting for folks to join. We had a couple hundred RSVPs, so we'll get started in about a minute. Feel free to get comfortable, get your blankets. It's going to be a very cozy conversation with our panelists. All right, everybody. So you should have the ability to use the chat feature if any issues are coming up. Thank you for joining Building Together on Black and Asian Organizing in Los Angeles, brought to you by our team at 18 Million Rising. My name is Sharman Hussain. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm the organizing director at 18 Million Rising. I want to begin with a note on access. Today's ASL interpreters are Ebony Gaetan and Stephanie Chow. We have live captioning provided by AI Media. We will be recording this workshop and sharing the recording with all who registered. We would also like to offer a content warning that we will be discussing issues like systemic racism, anti-Black racism, and police brutality. We will be showing short video clips from Liquor Store Dreams that discuss the violence experienced by Rodney King and Latasha Harlins. Please take care and take breaks if you need to. For any deaf and hard of hearing participants using ASL interpretation today, you can please reach out to the chat if you have any questions. The link for captions are also in the chat. 18 Million Rising is a national digital first organization. We are an Asian American organizing hub. We bring Asian American communities together online and offline to reimagine Asian American identity and to build a more just and creative world where our experiences are affirmed, our leadership is valued, and all of us have the opportunity to thrive. Thank you so much for following us all throughout the years. I'm excited to be here with you guys today. We're going to start with a digital land acknowledgement that was adapted from Adrian Wong of Spider Web Show. We hey, would Charmin, like to. Charmin, one moment. Just a note that um, for the ASL interpretation, if we could just slow down our speaking, uh, just the note I made in the comments that I wanted you to see. Thank you Thank so you. much. Good modeling because I thought I was going slow. Okay. <laughs> we would like to acknowledge that this event is rooted in Los Angeles on stolen Tongva land. But because we're online and joining from different places, let's consider the legacy of colonization embedded within the technologies, structures, and ways of thinking we use every day. We are using equipment and high-speed internet not available in many indigenous communities today. Even the technologies that are central to much of our work leave significant carbon footprints 
contributing to changing climates that disproportionately affect Indigenous people worldwide. We invite you to join us in acknowledging this, as well as our shared responsibility to make good of this time and for each of us to consider our roles in decolonization and solidarity. This is a digital land acknowledgement adapted from Adrian Wong of Spider Web Show. Thank you. So let's jump into our event today. We have some wonderful speakers that are coming from all over Los Angeles. Danny Park from Skid Row People's Market is a Korean community organizer running this brilliant market in Skid Row, a community-based grocery store that provides products and services that nourish the mind, body, and soul while uplifting the creative spirit. Their focuses are healthy food access, equitable jobs, and strengthening the community through co-creating safe and supportive environments. Thanks for joining us, Danny. We have Pastor Q with us today as well from Church Without Walls. Stephen Q founded the Row LA, which is also known as the Church Without Walls, over 13 years ago. He's a former Virgin Records rapper turned evangelist, activist, and organizer. He left the music business in 1994 to follow a religious calling. The Roe Congregation gathers every Friday night on the corner of Fifth and Wall in downtown LA, Skid Row, and it feeds people both spiritually and physically. Pastor Q is also with the clergy and United for Economic Justice, the Black Jewish Alliance, and We Will Live Coalition. Pastor Q's work includes helping to address unjust public policy issues in LA, as well as advocating for rights of homeless people, immigrants, Muslims, and countless other groups. Thanks for being here, Pastor Q. Last but not least, we have Soyeon Oh. Last but not least, we have Soyeon Um, a filmmaker, a Korean American director and producer born and based in LA. Her directorial debut documentary feature film, Liquor Store Dreams, which we have the privilege of watching today, is about second generation Korean American children of liquor store owners in the LA area. And it made its world premiere at the 2022 Tribeca Film Festival. Her work has screened at Tribeca Film Festival, Busan International Film Festival, BFI London, and more. We'll be sharing a few short clips from this documentary as a way to kickstart the conversation. The LA riots happened 31 years ago this week. On April 29, 1992, there was a historic uprising that called international attention to anti-Black racism, police brutality, and economic violence. At 18 MR, we know how important it is for Asian Americans to do the internal work, to reflect on our own complicity in economic and racial violence while fighting for a world without prisons, policing, and capitalism. We're sitting today with some brilliant organizers and people that are leading this work in LA. Please use the chat function in your questions or the Q&A function, and we'll respond to all of your queries. Liquor Store Dreams, which we're gonna jump into in a minute, is a personal film about immigrant dreams and generational divides. Through this film, so wonderfully explores the stories of liquor store baby, babies, kids whose Korean parents made the best of limited opportunities by running liquor stores in black and brown communities. She places these stories in the context of Korean and Black relations in LA. We're going to start with this first clip. And we have to change the screen. Sorry, can you repeat that? 
Oh, uh, we're going to have to exit out of the slideshow into the video screen, please. Okay, where I put this? Oh, sure. But still, 엄마 소 엄마 아빠는 그때 라이엇 때 있었기 때문에 아직도 그 흑인한테 그 마음이 똑같은 것 같아 안 변하고 Many came out and filled the streets, still trying to grapple how to promote peace between the Korean and Black community. And although there were many efforts to bridge our two communities together, I wonder how equipped they were to make any lasting changes amidst the trauma of losing everything. Although there is a lot of fear in my community of losing their businesses again, the tides are shifting. And many of us now understand that it's only through solidarity that can bring real change. after the Koreatown Peace Rally, here we are. I chose to assimilate with white people for my own self-preservation. I didn't speak up against racism because I was scared. My daughter is demoing, but I don't want to do that. Where do you go? There's a difference between me. There's no difference between me. There's no difference between me. 또 지나면 지나면 또 차별이 생겨 그거는 지금 저저 사람 차별하니까 저거 안 된다 싸워 이다 싸 그거는 일시적일 뿐. 근데 그런 차별을 어. 바꿀 수 있어? 없어요. 있어. 그러니까, 아니 있다고 하지만 내 얘가 얘는 없는 것 같은데. 아니 그 믿음이 있어야 돼. Sometimes 그런 거못 참아 싸워야 돼. 이럴 때는. 뭐 피스포 뭐뭐 don't distract 그런 말을 할 때가 아니라고. 응. 그게 나가 너무 아직 우리 깨달음이 안 생겼다 하는 게 너무 속상해요. 응. Anti blackness within our community is severe. Within the community of color is severe. And Asian communities is severe. Step by step, we don't have time, but we have to educate ourselves. Thank you, Leanne, for handling tech. We know that sometimes video is a little slower because of Zoom's quality, so apologies for that. But we hope you got to enjoy So Yan Um's amazing film and the way she captures community resilience. Pastor Q, this might be your first time watching this film, but I wanted to hear from you what resonates with you from this clip. What stood out to you? And how does your work connect to the critical conversations that this film sparks? Yeah, well, I think what it brought me back to, uh, I was on tour actually, um, right before the LA uprising. Uh, we were on tour on a tour called The Way Too Funky Tour with some dude named DJ Quick. Uh, and we were going from city to city and uh, we had come home for, just a, a small break. Uh, and what I can remember is watching, first of all, just, just everything going up in flames because I lived in Compton at the time on, on, a, on a street called Bullis. Uh, Suge Knight lived across the street from me. Uh, and we were right behind the Compton swap meet. 
um, and you can see uh, the Korean store owners with rifles on the on the roof, uh, trying to protect their property. So what it what it reminds me of when Pac, for those who don't know what, what I mean when I say Pac, when Tupac says uh, it talks about the roads that grew out of concrete, um, and many of us are addicted to roses growing out of concrete because it tells we you know we we're addicted to the story of oh you know these this person made it out of a difficult situation right but roses are not supposed to grow out of concrete the environment is the concrete right and so uh whether it be asian americans whether it be black folks we are in this context of concrete uh the environment is not suitable for life and for growth because of uh, the situations that we find uh, ourselves in. And oftentimes we uh, let systems off the hook by blaming it on individuals, right? Uh, we're addicted to individualism and um, personal responsibility, but we never look at the systemic responsibility uh, for these issues. And so to, to make that make sense, someone said to me one time, the drug dealers in Skid Row are preying on, uh, on our vulnerable people. And I asked them a question, I said, but who are the primary drug dealers? And I got that from uh, Pete White um, from LA Can, right? Um, he would always say, who are the primary um, you know, the primary, uh, 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 those who are taking advantage of, of folks, the primary predators. And so the system oftentimes is the primary predators and we're left to try to figure it out uh, amongst ourselves. Thank you for that reflection. I feel like oftentimes focusing on systems feels harder for the imagination um, because we see individuals and we engage with individuals on a daily basis. And so um, inviting you to the conversation, you did that work of having difficult conversations. Um, I wanted to hear from you about what that felt like. What were the narratives that you were hearing? What techniques did you use to start uncovering some of the stories that you needed for this storytelling? Hey, everybody. Uh, thank you for that. I, you know, I started the film, I started with the short film called Liquor Store Babies back in 2018, which uh, you could watch it on YouTube, Vimeo. And I, I think it wasn't until a year later after I went through a festival festival round where people were like, oh, you should make this into a feature length film. And I think at that point, I only envisioned what the film would be. Um, I had an initial plan, but obviously when 2020 hit and we were all kind of grappling with just so many things with the pandemic and um, we were being challenged like politically in in our own lives that it felt like if I what if I didn't turn the camera towards um, and go to these places that I was already kind of um, these stories that I was already trying to tell like what was why am I even telling the story if I'm not going to go there and I think um, because of the period that we were in it forced me to really have these tough conversations with my dad with my parents with my ent entire family really because I always say change starts at home and obviously within ourselves. And um, and I think for me, it was so scary just because I've never talked about race or anything with my parents before that. And I always say that being able to film it, uh, the camera really served as a mediator to between me and my dad, that they were the camera was able to hold me and my dad both accountable, but also create a safe space so we could have these conversations without it feeling like it's so scary, even though it is. And so I, I, not that everybody can, you know, film their conversations with their parents, but I do think that taking a kind of a step back and figuring out, you know, your parents the best, how can you approach this type of conversation um, in a safe environment? And also, I guess it's like a two way streak because they they're going to have to want to also participate because I can tell them, I think during um, all the 2020 protests, I kept sending them these little things, um, information through 
Pacao, the messaging app. And I think for them, it was more of a passive thing. Like they're just watching and hearing what I'm saying. They're not really engaging, but you kind of want them to engage. And I always say it's better to fight than not fight because at least you get to hear both sides out. And so that's kind of what we did throughout the film. We just kept fighting again and again. And that throughout that process, we did get closer. We did, we were able to hear each other's perspectives. And I think just trying to hear each other out. I think that's the most important thing that happened. Yeah, I really appreciate you being courageous and like wanting to, you know, poke those buttons. Cause as 18 MR team was watching it, we were also reflecting what are the gems from this that we can take and apply it to political education models and even how our parents and, and people within our generation see themselves. So we're going to queue up this next clip to, to go deeper into the Korean and Black relationships in LA. And we'll invite Danny to the conversation right after. The only liquor stores I knew was our own and the ones stereotyped in movies. If I never learned the history of the racial injustice in South LA before my family arrived till much later, my parents couldn't have known more than I did. Let's see what's up in this motherfucker. You ain't gotta be creeping. I don't know why you trying to act like you cleaning up. I always think we're gonna steal something. How y'all gonna go? Hey, man, you but all these you? shameful images of us on screen were called back to one real life incident that my community rarely talks about. Most people understand that it was the Rodney King verdict acquitting four police officers that sparked the 1992 LA uprising. But what some people may not remember is that only weeks after the Rodney King beating, a Korean store owner named Soon Ja Ju shot and killed a 15-year-old black teenager named Latasha Harlins over a $1.79 bottle of orange juice. I know a criminal when I see one. I know a person who presents a danger to the community when I see one. I think it was an, it was an injustice. Uh, justice has not been served. This lady has killed my 15-year-old granddaughter and she get away with five years probation. This is an injustice. The judge ruled that the Korean store owner was not going to receive any jail time after killing a black teenager. Compounded with the acquittal of the LAPD officers, events escalated quickly leading to many Korean-owned businesses in Koreatown burning during the 1992 LA uprising. Whenever I experience racial tension at my store, I feel like we are still connected to the controversies of the past. Just like my community that has been so quiet about their shame and pain, my dad and I also tend to process our hurt and pain in isolation. And there are incidents that occurred at our store that we still haven't talked about. There is one day I'll never forget. A random group of teenage girls came in and started opening and throwing around chips at one another. My dad told them to stop, but they wouldn't. They stood in front of the stores, eating the unpaid chips and taunting us. My dad went outside to tell them to leave, but they just laughed. And then it happened. They stood on each side of him and spit into his face. I was standing behind the bulletproof glass watching this all happen in slow motion. I felt paralyzed. 
my mom wanted to chase after them and asked me to come along. I said, it's just chips, let it go. So I get the money from my mother and I go in the store. I grab the Mars bar, I put it on the counter. And as I'm counting the change, this lady, she screams. And she's like, uh-uh, wait, hold on, no, stop, stop. What you doing, what you doing? I'm her mother outside, I'm gonna go outside and I'm gonna get her mother. Just, just. I learned watching the short film, The Dope Years, that Sun Jaju behaved recklessly and frequently pointed guns at children. As I look up, I'm looking down the barrel of a gun. Latasha's friend even warned her not to step into that store. And my mother comes into the store and she said, we paid for that. The receipt is in the bag. I asked you for the receipt. We just stepped outside. But even if Sunja Du's action didn't represent all Korean merchants, it still created shame in me. Maybe my fear of the liquor store has something to do with this stereotype, that I might get stuck in this place of negativity and turn into somebody that I don't want to be. Deep breath after seeing that clip. I know it probably brought up a lot for a lot of people. I wanted to open the space for so. Did you have any thoughts after seeing that? Anything you want to tell panelists and people on the um that are attending about this clip and what it meant for you to share this story well thank you for watching i know it's kind of a it's one of the toughest well not i guess toughest part for me and the viewer alike um i think in the context of a film it's probably and I think there's so many things I I want to unpack and I did unpack in the film. And this was one of the aspects of it. Um, when we talk about stereotypes, what does it mean to be a quote unquote angry liquor store owner? Um, what, how do we, how do we break away from that? And how do we not become this quote unquote stereotype? Because I do feel like some stereotypes do come from somewhere and um, and I, I think even when I was working at my dad's store, I felt this tension as well. And so I think that's something that I did want to explore, uh, just in the context of how we are being perceived, but also real life events that have happened. And so, um, yeah, I think it's, it was a necessary part of the story that I needed to tell. And I hope it, I'm, I know it does add in a lot to the to the entire film so yeah. yeah I'm being very vague right now no, but... it <laughs> and, it, and it goes and ebbs and flows you know mm -hmm. um Danny um you know one thing that I noticed a lot in you know these relationships that there's always power in I wanted to ask you as somebody who also navigates this as a store owner but also community organizer um, with these economic relationships, power relationships, what are some ways that you have navigated this? What have you um, seen in your like last few years that has also brought up some of these necessary work that we have to do? What comes, what comes up for me um, yeah. is that. Uh, you know, like uh, the name of, uh, of this event is also called Building Together. Um, and every day, you know, there's there's so much that so many people do. Um, and it can, it's, it's, it's uh, you know, it's not easy. Um, and uh, I, 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 I think I'm from kind of just reflecting like, uh, working with uh, Pastor Q, not only with working with Pastor Q, he's 
uh, taught me so much, uh, uh, mentored me and uh, so many uh, community leaders in, here in Skid Row in Los Angeles. And I, I think kind of the way we've been growing or building or it's, it's like, you know, it's, it's not only building and building uh, that this is like also a spiritual um, spiritual work and spiritual relation. Uh, and, you know, just our human, there's something that's more deeper than, you know, uh, finding a uh, building. I, I hear I, the word finding a solution to business, something like a solution, like something uh, we'll, we'll figure our way out of it or something. Um, I mean, I, I guess that's why there's so much, yeah, just healing as we go too. Uh, and so sometimes, you know, we need to break as well, stop. Um, that's all part of it. Uh, that's that's one thing that comes to mind. Uh, and also, yeah, like uh, kind of as we're building as well, like so much of kind of what you're building is like motivated by so much of like shame and hurt and guilt. Like this thing that you're constricting, this future that you're building, uh, this hustle, this grind, it's, it's coming from a source so much hurt. I, I I think that's something to be kind of cautious about. Like, are you? What is it that you're you're building? Is that gonna, you know, how that how you create or enforce or create changes changes you in the process as well? Uh, and so I can say, just speaking personally, I I do not want to like come from that space anymore. Like from hurt, from insecurity, trying to make up for something. I, I, I want to be open and curious, you know, um, and uh, explore and come and kind of love. Um, and so those are the things that, that comes to mind in watching that, and responding to the question. I love that reflection. It really reminds me of how much human relation is at the center of our organizing work and how sometimes it might not be an agenda or a fundraising goal, right? Like going back to the basics about how we even are in relationship to each other is a core part of this. Um, this is a question to all my panelists. So if I can spotlight them all. Um, Nowadays, Black and Asian solidarity is like a buzzword, right? People are really um, building out networks, whether it's Asians for Black Lives or prison abolition networks to support the work long term. Um, but I really wanted to hear from you all on how our attendees and organizers can really learn some authentic ways to build power. How do we become co-conspirators in each other's freedom in the way Danny framed it? Um, and, and how do you see, what does the work look like moving forward now that it's been 31 years? Um, are there things that we have gained and, and what? how does that feed the next 30 years? Well, if I may, I think, you know, coming off, you know, the conversation about building together, right? I, I'm reminded of the quote from Yuri Kachiyama as she was holding Malcolm X's head as he was bleeding out, right? She said, I just picked up his head and just put it on my lap and said, Malcolm, please stay alive. Please stay alive, right? Because they had engaged with each other uh, in a space. At first, Malcolm was very standoffish when um, when Yuri approached him, but she was relentless and would not let him retreat, right? And so. When I think about my relationship with not just with Danny, but other folks, um, I always understand that in order for us to move forward, we have to understand uh, the context of 1992 uh, from each of our communities, respectively, from our perspectives. But we also have to understand how we got there, right? 
we know that in during World War II, Japanese were sent into internment camps. Uh, prior to that, the second great migration of African Americans fleeing from the South, fleeing the KKK and white supremacy, moving North and West into places like South Central, Central Avenue runs from South Central into Little Tokyo. There was a housing crisis. There goes that housing thing again back then. And so when the Japanese were unjustly, by the way, by the same system sent into internment camps, Black folks moved into Little Tokyo into by the houses or the, 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 the place that Japanese had been expelled from. Same system, right? Um, we're sent into um, these communities. You have restricted land covenant. You have um, redlining. Black folk can't be, can't live in certain communities. We're all in these ghetto fied communities, right? We're all in these hoods. And then immigrants come from other countries, right? Even those who've had to overcome the Chinese Exclusion Act, right? Come from other countries. And we're all pushed into these same communities together in the context of pain and trauma, right? Caused by a system and even some of us are bringing uh, pain from our own context because I'm an Afro-Caribbean American, right? Because my great grandmother's mother was taken from Africa when she was 11 years old, enslaved, trafficked to the Caribbean. That's why I sit here today. So understanding all of these things, all of these complexities, even folks from where I'm from, look down on African-Americans. Well, they have all these opportunities, why can't they? But they don't understand the generational trauma that folks are carrying. So when we're all put in these same communities, white supremacy is shielded while white supremacy's foot is on our necks. So we have to understand that and I believe understanding that is, uh, is the, the fuel and the encouragement that will bring us together so that we know we don't have a choice in the matter. We've got to fight white supremacy together or we will lose. People in the chat are snapping their fingers saying thank you. Um, inviting Danny or so if you have anything to add. Uh, you know, the, what, what comes to mind is, um, uh, like, uh, just, just here being at the market every day, like, uh, we have the, like, you know, it's, it's a pretty tight community. Uh, it's, uh, you know, the regular is like, uh, we have community members, our friends, uh, you know, they, they walk my mom to her car. She has a lot of uh, uh, luggage or stuff, bags and stuff. Uh, you know, they carry the bag to her car or, um, you know, um, while she's unloading helps her and stuff like that. And, uh, you know, when you talk about the Korean Black relation or Black Korean black conflict, like, and what Pastor Q uh, brought into white supremacy, it's like, like, you know, like that's also like not the only thing that's happening. Um, and then I tie that larger in, like into no understanding our, where we come from in our history. And uh, also, uh, you know, the, the media's role and damn it, how it often makes us see the worst in each other. It makes us see the worst in us, uh, I think, I feel. Um, also, it's like not the only thing that happens uh, every in, your, in, the day, in the day in your life. 
you know, there's so many things that happen and the things that you pay attention to and uh, what you're paying attention to. Um, and so when these large, these narratives are constructed and you don't know who's not part of these stories, you know, getting away with it all or not really, they just don't exist in this narrative and what, what's happening, why it happened this way. And so, yeah, I just kind of adding to that, uh, like kind of the work of like, how do you inspire, inspiring, wanting to learn more? Um, you know, like, like our parents, like not college educated, coming here when you're young, not knowing the language. And then after that, you're just trying to survive every day, you know? And so that makes it very difficult to, you know, uh, learn about this country, the, the really complex, the, the roots, the history of this. And, and so if there are ways when we can, I mean, that's why I think like uh, liquor store dreams and the power of like storytelling, it's, it's such a, these uh, types of media, they're very, it, you see people engage, it's entertaining, it's historical, you learn about it and you don't know that you're also learning at the same time. And, and so I think those are very powerful. So I guess I'll add, add that. So did you wanna add anything or should I show the next clip? I'll just say one thing, Pastor Q, that was so powerful. I like shed a tear right now. Um, I, I feel so much of what you say, I learn so much every time you talk and say just anything. But um, I, I do agree that historical context and just knowing so much, so much more of our history, like Danny said, a lot of our parents don't know. And I think even making this film was my way of learning because I never took an Asian American studies class, which is my fault. I'm, I am going to definitely go back and take a course because without where you come with knowing where you come from, where our parents come from, I'm just kind of here trying to navigate this world, kind of going blind. And I think that making this film helped me learn so much. Also, I made this film so it could be taught in schools, so people could learn more about um, our history, but also how we how we can inform uh, us now so we could help our, our future. And so um, thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you for making it. Yeah. And to Danny's point, like the work, the work is happening is what I think is so critical to highlight that every day people are fighting the systems that isolate us. And we actually have to pay more attention to that because those are the networks and the relationships that will grow. And this last clip that we're going to show really just symbolizes the beauty of the way you guys are working, the fun, the joy you guys bring, but also the sacred ritual. So we're going to show this last clip and please chat in your question and answers because we're going to close out with folks's queries, opinions, anything. Um, so be sure to do that. neighborhood that we're in in Skid Row and always hearing like the term homelessness and houselessness and that's a part of what we're looking for right our identity Korean American children of liquor store owners immigrant store owners the sense of belonging because we don't quite feel home in Korea and we don't quite feel home here in America the house is a physical structure but like a home is a non-tangible. And so I feel like we're all constantly searching for that, a sense of belonging where you feel accepted for just who you are. As a second generation Korean American, I've always dreamt of a future where communities aren't pitted against each other, but building together. 
If anyone can do it, it's Danny. That clip brings me so much joy. Um, Danny and So, when you um, introduced this Korean drum circle, did you share with people about the history of it? How did people respond to it? Um, do you want to tell people about what it is too, just in case people don't know about the significance of it? Okay, I'm on. Um, yeah, uh, this is it's called Pungmul. Pungmul. Um, it's a traditional drumming uh, from Korea. What I what I know, it's uh, it's um, yeah, it's an indigenous Korean drumming practice. Um, and so, yeah, I I personally got to give a shout out to my Korean friends and comrades who. Uh, like Gio and uh, Teresa Hyona and um, Juliet and uh, Nade and Angela, who helped me to uh, see the political roots of, uh, of this drumming practice. And then, you know, I, I got to see that, you know, in, in, in many indigenous uh, cultures, uh, drumming is, you see, it's, it's, it's a common practice. Um, and so, I, I mean, just simply put, uh, you know, it, it was a way to, uh, you know, raise the vibe, the vibrancy, the spiritual health. And, you know, also without like, I, I wasn't so aware, it wasn't so like, um, I wasn't so conscious of it, but, uh, you know, there was a long, there was a period where working at the market, I was having a lot of uh, just conflict with uh, the uh, folks who've worked here longer than I have. Uh, um, and, uh, you know, Korean and just different viewpoints, um, and also seeing the, you know, just the, the discrimination, the racism that you see in a lot of, I mean, exactly, this is what we're, we're, we're talking about, the, it's a common thing. And, uh, and uh, I, I could not get people to change. And I learned uh, very uh, quickly, in a uh, not quick, I just I learned that you know I, I can't force I can't make people it just ch to change you know it caused me much suffering uh, and then there came a point where um, uh, I had to change my ways and I really just started listening more um, and uh, you know I, I started becoming more curious about uh, you know the the folks working here like their stories of when they immigrated to America, what was their story like and where they come from in Korea and, uh, and also, you know, how they got to start working here, um, you know, and uh, I guess without knowing like the bringing in the kind of the, the drumming and the, that building that sense of like pride of uh, who we are, uh, like, it, it was kind of like, I think from uh, being ashamed of yourself, uh, you know, for folks, they, you know, sharing that I, I don't wanna be, don't, I don't want anyone to know I work here. Or, you know, these are the things I hear, you know, they share it with me and, um, uh, you know, now how it is people are, they're very proud. There's a lot of ownership of everyone who works here taking ownership of we are federal people's market. Um, and also, yeah, like it's kind of, uh, uh, I guess the word, yeah, the word pride comes to mind being proud of, and also knowing kind of like you're building that solidarity because, you know, this is a very, it is a shared, this is a shared, shared, shared customs, you know? In, America, in in this land that we're in. And so I think, yeah, that's kind of when I watched that uh, part of the film, it, it what comes to mind like that it's kind of a, that, you know, we're here and we're not, we don't have to be ashamed of who we are. Um, and, you know, in so many ways, we're more alike with, it's, we're, we're, and we're stronger together. So that's kind of, 
I love that. Um, I'm going to also sprinkle in Q&A from folks as we walk through the next 10 minutes so we can get to people's questions. But Danny, real quick, people want to know how and why people's market started. And then I'll pass it to our next few questions. Uh, schedule people's market it, it started it, so yeah we're on our 28th year it used to be called best market it was more of a convenience store uh, that my parents ran and uh just moving back to los angeles and, and working here like uh uh this as as i was changing to transforming and 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 you know being involved with the community uh you know it's just healthy food, jobs, you know, a place where we can just for us, by us, where we can run this space by the for and by the community. That's kind of all what that informed the uh, kind of the transformation of the business. I love it. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna also field some other questions that people are asking. Um, Pastor Q, there's a student leader from their school's AAPI affinity group. They wonder how should they frame a joint meeting between Black and AAPI affinity groups? What should be emphasized in our discussion to promote solidarity? Awesome. I, oh, sorry. I'll add that second question later. Okay. So I think listening to the context, right? First of all, we've got to understand the historical context, like I said before. But also, um, that's something they have to figure out themselves through conversation with each other, right? Because each context is going to be different. And so um, in talking with each other and conversating with each other, they can come up with, um, with collective, um, collective understanding and, and, and mutual, um, you know, a, a mutual framework uh, and do so. Uh, with respect. That's how Danny and I work. Um, uh, Danny is on our Creating Justice Board of Directors. I'm on Skid Row Coffee's Board of Directors. But prior to that, we were in, we, we started uh, learning groups together, learning uh, from each other. And I think um, that's where it begins. It begins first by digging in and diving deep with each other. And then uh, out of that, you can you, your agenda, I believe, will emerge like a rose that grew out of concrete. Amazing. Um, some of the other questions were around religion and how white supremacy sometimes manifests in religion. People are asking, what keeps you full? hopeful and faithful being a part of a religious community, um, especially as our, we're seeing an uptick of religious conservatives cite, citing violence through the doctrines that we love and appreciate, you know? Um, so some people want to know about how do you fit it together through a liberatory lens? Religion. I've seen people do tremendous good in the name of religion and tremendous damage in the name of religion. So, and we understand when we look at the historical context and we look at um, the Puritans, right? Who brought um, the religious context for American Christianity uh, from the Aristotelian philosophy that the Ethiopian was the black face and that they were, uh, the whole anti-blackness thing comes from that carried on the, um, I would say on the caravan of white supremacy, trying to find a new land through the, uh, basically the doctrine of, you know, discovery doctrine, which none of this stuff is real. None of this stuff is true because indigenous people were here before I, I, I see uh, European Christianity as the Columbus of, uh, of philosophies, right? Uh, we have to decolonize our theology. Um, I still believe in uh, my own faith tradition and it's a personal thing, right? Faith's personal, so I still believe in Jesus. 
Uh, but I tell people all the time, Revelation described Jesus as someone with burnt feet burned like brass and hair white like wool and uh, the texture of wool. You know what it looks like? It looks like an old black man with an afro, right? And eyes of fire. So I said, I know you guys like to worship a white Jesus here on earth, but the question is, can you, and, and the scriptures describe this as Jesus, Jesus's glorified body. That is the ultimate body. So my, I always ask them, I know you can uh, worship a white Jesus. Question is, can you worship a, a, a black Jesus? Because the glorified Jesus is black. So can you worship that Jesus? That's gonna be a question. So um, I think decolonizing theology is very important because for some folks, religion is very dear to their heart but we have to decolonize um, our theology and take it out of the context of white supremacy. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor Q. Um, I wanted to go quick fire around and ask people, how can people take action? How can people get involved? What fundraisers, events do you want to let people know about? We will be sharing this beautiful um, toolkit and resource at the end of this with everybody who RSVP'd, created by the 18MR uh, creative team. So we are wanting to call to action. Where do we send people? Well, being that no one is saying anything. Um, uh, well, Danny and I are excited because we're getting ready to open um, our Peace and Healing Center in Skid Row, the grand opening is May uh, 26. We'll be doing everything from uh, peace and healing uh, to music therapy. Um, and I want to say to uh, to Soul that uh, you know Barry Belafonte, Belafonte, Harry Belafonte just passed away, and one of his mentors, Paul Robeson, says. Uh, that the artists are the gatekeepers of truth, right? And so um, I was reminded of that when I saw the drumming and also connecting it with, with the film, Liquor Store Dreams. Um, so this is an invitation to, 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 to have, host an event at the Peace and Healing Center in Skid Row. Um, it's a seed, but we don't know exactly what's gonna grow out of that. So uh, that's coming soon. Indeed. And you can also, as always, I mean, I'm sure you guys know how to find us, how to follow us. Uh, and so we're not trying to change the world, but we're trying to impact uh, individuals to help them change the world. That's so exciting. So is there anything that you want to uplift or invite people to? Um, thank you so much for even just joining this conversation. I feel like I we I do a lot of these panels, but today just felt like a little bit more emotional, um, which I'm always thankful for because you know I love a good cry. Um, but no, we're finally having our LA premiere of Liquor Store Dreams May 10th at the LA Asian Pacific Film Festival. So please come. I think we'll have the film eventually out by the summer, which we're really really excited about and. Um, Thank you, 18 million rising for facilitating this conversation because I always feel like it's very needed. I always feel like every every year, every time I even show the film, people are like, what can we do? What can we do? And I think you know, having a very clear cut, I it's it's not good enough to just say, talk to your neighbors, talk to your parents, uh, learn history. I feel like there's so much. It's truly a lifelong journey that you have to actively are taken because so much of society wants you to actually do the opposite. And so you have to stay engaged. You have to be pretty vigilant and disciplined in creating this future that you really wanna see because I do think it's possible. It's just really up to us to make that happen. And yeah, it's really hard, but I think in a lot of ways we're we're all taking our little part to, to do and make this a reality and a, a world that we want to see and yeah my also the website you could check out the website there's a lot of stuff there so yeah feel free to connect with us we're going to do a lot more events screenings and uh things like that so thank you 
Awesome. Danny, is there anything you want to share too? I know that we're all looking forward to the healing center and supporting that. Okay. Um, just to say something. Uh, uh, well, one one tie with the with the Skid Row People's Market. Uh, I mean, not only Skid Row People's Market. So many, so many places. Uh, uh, right now, the uh, you know the the benefits or the assistance that folks were receiving uh, uh, from the beginning of the pandemic have been uh, ended. So uh, you know that's that's one way folks can contribute with uh, at Skid Row People's Market. We got grocery gift cards. Um, so that's something that anyone can purchase, and we could uh, distribute it here in the community. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I guess I also felt it, it uh, aside from like an ex like a explicit action thing, <laughs> um, I felt compelled to say like, oh man, like reflecting back from the cor coronavirus and the shutting down all that stuff, like, man, we're all so busy again. And so it's like, oh, what do you just uh, kind of, if you can, what do you, what are you busy about again? Like, just, I think that that could be helpful. Just, you know, uh, so that that's the, maybe an uh, ask for action. I love that. I, not, you're to like, do any, not do anything. Yeah, you're like, let's slow down and let's like chill out and actually just be for a bit. I love yeah, it. Yeah, take a look at the tree outside. I love this. Yeah, <laughs> like look at the tree, touch the trees and breathe with each other. Yeah. Um, thank you all so much. Um, Leanne's going to be sharing our screen real quick to show you this amazing resource guide that is going to take some of these learnings, these quotes. quotes. Um, um, oh, I hear myself. Awesome. Can you? Okay. So um, this resource guide is available for free download. So you can click the link in the chat and go ahead and get this resource. You can take it to classrooms, like so said. We are going to be sharing the recording to everybody who RSVP'd. The links to donate to Skid Row People's Market are also going to be shared. They're in the chat as well. Church Without Walls, the link to donate is there as well. And if you want to screen Liquor Store Dreams, so is always looking to take this movie far and wide. So we really just want to thank you for joining us today. We're going to be building power together in the years to come. So like Danny said, we're going to also take our time building and breathing with each other. Thank you everybody for coming out today. And I hope that you all have a wonderful weekend. Thank you for everybody. Yeah. Blessings. Thank you. Much Thank love you. to LA. Mm. Bye y'all.